John chapter 3, picking up in verse 9, Nicodemus said to him, how, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher in Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe... How will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who de descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him have, whoever believes will, <laughs> whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already." because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed." But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifest as having been wrought in God. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father, again, we are, we are a group of people who are grateful for your word. Father, we often take for granted the, the ease of access we have to your word. And even more often, we may take for granted how quickly, easily, and readily, readily available it is, and we can read through it without much thought, read through it without really investigating what is going on. And Father, our prayer tonight is that we would take some time in these passages, look at what is going on in the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we will pray that you'd grant us an understanding of the mindset of these two men as they're conversing, Nicodemus and Jesus. You'd give us an understanding so that the, the words on this page are beneficial to our own souls. They're an encouragement to us uh, that they would be used by you, by your Holy Spirit, to encourage our souls into greater service to bring honor and glory to the name of Jesus Christ. We ask this in his wonderful name. Amen. You may be seated. Last time we were in uh, our study on Sunday night looking at the life of Christ, we began this conversation between Jesus and this Pharisee named Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus was not just some run-of-the-mill Pharisee. Uh, it says that he was a ruler of the Jews. That means he was a part of the Sanhedrin. He came to Jesus by night, and there's this interview between him and Jesus. He had made the claim, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God because nobody can do the things you've done. And so remember, we talked about how while he is at this Passover, he has probably done many miracles. We were told earlier in the end of chapter 2 that many believed in him because of the works he was doing. So evidently he did something that made a lot of people at least look at him as a miracle worker. 
And then Nicodemus comes and says, look, we know that you have to be sent from God because only God or someone from God can do the things you're doing. The interesting thing is John does not give in to our desire. We want to know what he did. John doesn't tell us. Neither do any of the other synoptic gospels. They do not tell us what he did during this Passover. But it had to be extraordinary because it led these people to have some kind of belief in him and it led Nicodemus to believe there's more to this man than just a teacher. He has to be from God. And so he comes to him. Jesus gives that incredibly difficult statement by saying, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that blows Nicodemus's mind. Now, again, remember, Nicodemus understands Jesus is speaking. He's using an illustration. He knows Jesus is not saying you have to physically be born again. So he goes with the exact same illustration, and he wants to know, how can a man be born when he is old? He can't enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born. And Jesus doesn't back off and tells him if he's not born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. For Nicodemus, a Pharisee, and we're going to see here in a moment uh, one of the great teachers in Israel, he's running into something that just really troubles his mind here. What he is being told by Christ is contrary to everything he's believed. He believes, just like all Pharisees, he believes just like all the Jews did then, I'm a Jew, I'm in. I am born, I am of the descendants of Abraham, I am in the kingdom of God. The Jews are in the world, they're out. They have to become Jews to get in. That's what they believed, that's what they're holding on to. Jesus has told them, you, you must be born again. Nicodemus doesn't understand it. Jesus told him, look, it's like the wind blowing. You can't see it. You can't determine it. You can't make, you can't make the wind blow from one direction to the other. You can't stop the wind from blowing, but you can see its effects. You see the effects. That's where we left off. And so as we pick up in verse 9, before we really get into these verses, I want to let you know there is some debate among scholars. Some say that the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus ended at verse 8, and that this is just commentary on it. But you'll notice there it appears that the conversation is continuing here. There's more questioning, uh, another question by Nicodemus, and Jesus continues. So it appears that the conversation is still going, and it starts by Nicodemus with Nicodemus in verse 9 says, how can these things be? You're telling me that in order for me, a Jew, to be in the kingdom of God, I have to be born again. I, I don't know how to do that. I, that doesn't make any sense to me. You're telling me I can't understand it because it's like the wind blowing. I can just see its effects. And so he's really wanting to know how. How? It makes no sense to me. It was simple. It was simple. All I had to do was be born a Jew. I'm in. Now you've made it so much more difficult. I've got to be born again. Look, can you imagine that? Can you imagine someone telling you before you can do anything, before you can be a member of Agape Baptist Church, you've got to be born again? Well, do you realize how challenging that is? What did you do to bring about your original birth? Nothing. Well, if I didn't do anything to bring that one about, now you're telling me I have to be born again to get into this. How in the world am I going to do something? How can I do this? Can't. And so he says, how can these things be? You can almost translate that as him saying, you're making this too hard. I can't do that. I can't. 
I can't be born again. It is impossible. Up to this point, up to his encounter with Jesus, Nicodemus was sure that he was in the kingdom of God. Christ has really blown his mind, and so he asked, how can this be? And instead of making things easier, Jesus steps it up a little bit. Maybe being a little sarcastic here in his, his response. Jesus' response is, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? You're coming to me, a Pharisee, on the Sanhedrin. And notice he says, the teacher of Israel. He puts the article there. He's saying, you're the elite. You're, you're telling me you're the elite teacher in Israel and you don't understand this. You're supposed to. <laughs> There's almost that in, indication here. He's saying, Nicodemus, you, you among all of them. If you don't understand it, how are the people going to understand it? If you don't understand it, how are you going to teach it to anybody? You, the teacher of the Jews, you don't understand these things? And so we're sitting here thinking, okay, well, explain it to us. <laughs> so he says, truly, truly, before we go there, Remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus, he called him rabbi. He called him, he called Christ teacher. Jesus is turning that, that greeting back around on him. You call me teacher, but you're the teacher. And you don't know this. Again, so if you don't know, if it's too much for you, if it's too hard for you to understand, how are the people going to understand it? Again, Jesus is taking the understanding that this is too hard, this is too much, and he's saying, you're right. You're right, you can't. This is more than you can understand. You, the teacher of Israel, you can't understand it, so the people can't either. And then... Again, he says, truly, truly, I say to you that this is a, this is a statement of authority. Um, he does not say, truly, truly, Scripture says to you. He does not say, truly, truly, the fathers of old. He does not say, the, the elders say to you. He says, I say to you. He is declaring a little bit of authority here. And then he makes this drastic change. I want to read you his response, and I want you to listen to this. Remember, this is a conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus. As we've read through this, you've seen Nicodemus and Jesus, right? Remember earlier, Nicodemus said, we know that you have come from God. Here, Jesus says, starting in verse 11, truly, truly, I say to you, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen. Who's the we? In this passage, we have Nicodemus and we have Jesus. Who's the we? He said, truly, truly, I say to you, we. Well, who in the world are the we? Is he referring to his apostles? Maybe. Look, um, they're not mentioned in chapter 3, though, right? We don't see them anywhere there. Uh, they may be present. They may not be present. We know that they were at the Passover because they heard and they saw the things that took place between him and the, the leaders in the temple. But if it is the apostles, he says, we speak to you of what we, test, what we know and testify of what we have seen. Well, they haven't seen all that much. If it, if it is the apostles, they had not seen all that much. 
They saw him turn water into wine at a wedding. They've seen what he's done at the Passover. So they've seen a little bit, but what do they know? I, you can imagine that they are just as bewildered as Nicodemus at this point. Has, have you ever seen anybody turn water into wine? They hadn't either. And they're like, wow, look at that. They get to the Passover, and one man shuts the entire place down and takes control of the entire temple complex. Wow, check that out. That, that's something else. How is he doing these things? They don't know. So it's probably not his apostles when he says, we. What about him and the Father and the Holy Spirit? Maybe. He doesn't say that. But we, we know that those three know these things and would be testifying them things. Another possibility is he's saying, me and John the Baptist. We've been testifying to these things. We've told you these things. We, we know these things. We've told you what we know. Could be. Another possibility could be him and the Old Testament prophets. And when you read through the Old Testament, they've been telling the people, he's coming. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. But they never saw him. He says, we testify what we've seen. They never saw him. The issue here is not really who we may be. His point is, you've been told the truth. If it is him, if it is the Old Testament prophets, if it is John the Baptist, if his we is an inclusive to the authors of Scripture and John the Baptist and anybody that is, else has been teaching the truth, any other prophet that has been teaching the truth, he is saying, you've heard it. We have told you. The issue is you've heard it. But you do not accept our testimony. We've told you and you don't believe. When he says that, in verse 11, you know, notice he went from the singular I to the plural we. Then when you get to verse 12, he says, If I told you earthly things and you do not believe how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things verse 11 when he said I me singular say to you singular Nicodemus that we who we I don't know verse 12 if I singular told you plural the you there in verse 12 is plural. Told you, plural, earthly things in you, plural, do not believe. How will you, plural, believe if I tell you, plural, heavenly things? All of a sudden, Jesus has included a lot more people than were just in that room. He's saying, we have told you. And if we have told you earthly things and you don't believe, how will all of you believe heavenly things? Could be Nicodemus and his group when he come in and said, we know. But it could be Nicodemus and everyone else in Jerusalem, everyone else in Israel that refused to believe the Word of God. And that's the point. He said, you, you've been told. And then notice what he said. If we tell you earthly things, he said, there, there are things we've told you that have taken place on earth, things that have been seen, things that have been witnessed by people, and you don't believe those. If you can't believe what you've been told, what has been seen here, how are you going to believe what comes from above? And again, you can't 
unless you are born again. His whole point is without the new birth, <laughs> you can't believe heavenly things. You're not even going to believe earthly things. So without the new birth, you, you can't believe heavenly things. In verse 13 and 14, he makes this statement. He says, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the son of man. What he's basically saying here is, how are you going to know what took place up there unless somebody from up there come down here and told you, hey, that's me. That's what he's saying. I was there and I come down here. You want to know what's up there? I'm here to tell you. But no one can tell you what's up there unless they've been there and seen it. And, and that's me. And then he says in verse 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Again, he's answering the question again about being born again. He says, as Moses lifted up the servant. Now, Nicodemus would have known exactly what he's talking about. And those of you who have been students of Scripture, you know what he's talking about. When the children of Israel are making their way from Egypt into the promised land, because they murmured, like we talked about this morning, because they complained about God, God sent serpents. And these serpents started biting the people, and they were dying. And so the stave off the plague... God had Moses. God sent, told Moses to make a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. Lift it up, set it up, and he told him if anyone is bit, if any man is bit, if he'll just look to the pole, he won't die. Strangest medicine I've ever heard of. Normally they want to stick a needle in your arm or something, take a pill. But he says... If you'll look to the serpent, if they'll look to the serpent, they won't die. Look, it, it boiled down to this for them, obedience. There was no power in that serpent. There was no power in that pole. It was all in God, and it was all in their obedience. Look, this is what I'm telling you to do. If you want to be saved, look here. Bit, look, boom, saved. It was simply obedience to what they're told to do. It's having faith that what God told me I needed to do is what I need to do. And if I do what God tells me to do, I live. So look to the serpent. And then he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must. That is a huge, if you mark in your Bible, you ought to underline that one, circle it, highlight it, something. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. When he says lifted up here, he is speaking about his death. He is talking about the fact that he must be crucified. It is not a possibility. It is not something that might have to happen. It must take place. He must be lifted up. And then he says, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. Those who looked to the serpent and they believed, they trusted what God said, they would, they would live. And he's saying the same is, same is true here. Those who believe in the Son of Man that has been lifted up will have eternal life. And in verse 16, a statement that would have Nicodemus wouldn't know what to do with this one. Because he says, for God so loved the Jews that he gave his only begotten son. That's not what he said. For God so loved the world. Nicodemus is sitting there thinking, he's going to say Jews. He's going to say Jews. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, whether it be Jew or Gentile, believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And Nicodemus is saying, you mean you don't have to become a Jew. You're telling me 
that Gentiles can be in the kingdom too without becoming a Jew. This is a great statement for you and I. We're not Jews. And Jesus is telling him, God so loved the world, not just the Jews, Nicodemus. His goal is to save people from all over the world of every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every language. He sent his son to, to die for them that anyone who believes in him shall not perish. Verse 17, for God did not send the son into the world to judge the world. Not the first time. Second time, that's what he's going to do. We talked about that this morning, right? But that the world might be saved through him. Again, notice he keeps using the phrase, the world, the world, the world. Not just the Jews, Nicodemus. Anybody from anywhere, if they believe in him, they're not going to be judged. They'll be saved. He says, he who believes in him is not judged. Because the judgment is on Christ. Christ is going to suffer the wrath of God on the cross, suffer the judgment of God on the cross for everyone who believes in Christ. So they won't be judged. And then notice he says, he who does not believe has been judged already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Those who do not believe, those who reject, they're, already, they're un, under condemnation already. They're already condemned. Verse 19, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Uh, it's unique that we're in this passage after looking at the characteristics of the apostates this morning. The desire, our, our desires are so often evil desires. That, that is the desire of man. And there was once a time in order to keep from being shamed, we hid those acts. We didn't expose it to everybody. When we were doing something sinful, we didn't broadcast it to everybody. Look what I'm doing. Because we were ashamed of those acts because there was this, this preaching from the church that the Lord says this is sin. This is sin. And so they were ashamed of that. And, and now, look, if you'll just hush, right? If we can stop the light, then my deeds aren't exposed. I don't have to worry about it. Let's get rid of the light, they, they did not want the light. That's one of the reasons why so many people don't want to hear it from us when we witness. Because their deeds are evil and the Word of God exposes those evil deeds. Here's the, here's the thing they don't understand. Our desire is to expose those evil deeds so they can be dealt with, dealt with upon the cross, and they can be saved, transformed, and brought into the kingdom of God. But they hate the light. They love their evil deeds. That's what it boils down to here. Man loves his sin more than he would care for Christ. Man loves his sin more than he does righteousness. He concludes in verse 21 by saying, but he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifest as having been wrought in God. Well, we love the light. We want, we want our life to be exposed. We do not mind the accountability of others because we want people to see, this is what God has done in me. That's a testimony many of you have given. I've talked to you and, and it's always, well, that's what God is doing in me. That's what God is that's what he's saying. That's what we want people to see. This is what God has done in me. God has transformed me, changed me into this. Not perfect yet, but I'm not who I was. Right? That's where we are. We're not who we were. But we are being changed. And it's not us. God is doing this in us. As we look at John chapter 3, what we're looking at is Jesus' theology of salvation. There are two truths that are told very plainly in these 21 verses. The first truth is salvation is a work of God and man can't do it. 
It is completely impossible for man to do anything for salvation. It is a work of God in his alone. Salvation for man, from man's perspective, is impossible. We can't do it. We can't do it for others, but we can't do it for ourselves either. The number one truth Jesus is giving here is that salvation is solely a work of God. The number two truth is that man is responsible. Notice the change when we got to verse 9 and the, through what we looked at this morning. How many times or this evening he kept saying, believe. You have to believe. You don't believe. You have to believe. You don't believe. Those who don't believe are, are hate the light. Those who do believe love the light. The difference is not, the difference between the believer and the unbeliever is not whether we are guilty or innocent. That's not the issue. The, the difference between the believer and the unbeliever is in the different attitude toward the light. We either believe in the light or we don't believe in the light. We're both guilty. We're both guilty of sin. The difference is whether we believe or don't believe. Two truths. And when we look at these truths, salvation is impossible. It is a work of God alone, but man is responsible. We look at those with our human minds and we're like, it is impossible for man, but man is responsible. How in the world? How in the world do we get that? Because it, it's like a train track. They're two parallel lines. They're made out of steel. God is responsible. God is uh, over salvation alone. Man is responsible and they never meet. How? Charles Spurgeon was once asked how he reconciled. Now, that, that's the key to this question. How he reconciled these two truths. And his response was, you don't need to reconcile friends. They work together. How? I don't know. Neither did Nicodemus. <laughs> Neither do you. But they're there, aren't they? It's all of God. Man's responsible. God has to do it or it's not going to get done. But man is responsible. How do they work together? Mm. We'll ask Nicodemus when we get there. Maybe by the time we get there, Nicodemus will have it worked out. The Bible. Jesus clearly teaches salvation is a work of God alone. And that man is responsible. So you know what we'll do? We'll teach them both. We'll teach both without apologizing, without being ashamed. We will teach both. We will say, God must save you, but you better come. God can save and only God can save, but you must repent. Those are the two truths that we're given to preach, and we will hold to them. Any questions, comments? Anybody here have that one settled? They can fully explain those two. All right, let's, let's close with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, we would love to ask how. We can see ourselves. Uh, we can be, we can picture ourselves with Nicodem Nicodemus. How can these things be? But Father, we also see them in Scripture. We see they're clearly taught in Scripture. And so, Father, we want to do what Christ was encouraging Nicodemus to do and, and demanding must be done. Father, we'll believe them both. We believe that salvation is impossible from our side. We believe that it comes from you alone. But we also believe that we're responsible for repenting and trusting, looking to the cross of Christ for our salvation. Father, we pray that you'd help us to remain ever faithful to those two truths. 
Help us to faithfully proclaim those truths. Help us to use the, the Word of God and, and the theology of Christ here to call sinners to repentance and faith. Help us to be faithful to sharing the gospel with those around us. Lord, as we leave this place tonight, as we go into uh, the work week, as we are engaging with those who are outside of the church this week, use us to bring honor and glory to your name. Use us, Father God, as witnesses that you may be magnified and glorified through us. We ask this in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.